Always a big, it's always a busy weekend. How's that for a start? For, I hope the whole week doesn't go this way. <laughs> The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Takeo Comfort Solutions. Easy for you to say, Wabbit. Uh, we've got a lot going on here this evening. Obviously, the president uh, and his fingers are, are, are in the middle of it again. Uh, I don't know what he's thinking. We'll talk about it a little bit tonight. Uh, but mostly, we're going to focus on some of the, uh, the climate issues and our pulling out of the the Paris Accord and what that means. We've got some top-notch guests on that. And also, uh, Rhode Island is kind of mired in this family prosperity index thing in the bottom of the pack. And Mike Stenhouse from the Center for Freedom and Prosperity is here to talk to us about that this evening. So thank you very much for joining us. I think we've got the tongue untwisted. Uh, headline here is uh, just why, why? Why would you renew a war of words with the, with the mayor of London? For, for what particular constructive reason? That is, that is my question. And what I don't understand is that Donald Trump doesn't understand what the mayor was actually trying to say there. It is perplexing to me why he starts these things. He's also all jammed up uh, today in terms of the travel ban conversation. He's got an entire Justice Department that is trying to unwind what he has done, and then he triples down on it today and more or less blows them to kingdom come when it comes to the court system. And for some reason, he doesn't seem like that matters very much. It's very strange. Here's the latest from CBS. This bloodshed must end. This bloodshed will end. At a Sunday night reception at the Ford Theater, President Trump vowed to stop terrorism. I will do what is necessary to prevent this threat from spreading to our shores and work every single day to protect the safety and security of our country. Before speaking with British Prime Minister Theresa May, Mr. Trump's first reactions came on Twitter, where he pointed to the terror attack as a reason to support his court-suspended travel ban on six Muslim-majority countries. I'm appalled and furious that these cowardly terrorists will deliberately target innocent Londoners. The president also took aim at London Mayor Sadiq Khan for these comments. Londoners will see an increased police presence today and over the course of the next uh, few days. No reason to be alarmed. Mr. Trump mocked the attempt to reassure Londoners not to be alarmed by the unusual sight of armed officers. The mayor's spokesman called it, quote, an ill-informed tweet that deliberately takes his remarks out of context. The TIFF is yet another awkward moment for U.S. relations with European allies, who are still reeling from the president's withdrawal from the Paris Climate Change Agreement, a deal negotiated by former Secretary of State John Kerry. He's going to go out and find a better deal? That's like... I mean, that's like O.J. Simpson saying he's going to go out and find the real killer. Everybody knows he isn't going to do that because he doesn't believe in it. Mr. Trump previously called climate change a hoax, but on Sunday, U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley suggested his views may have changed. He believes the climate is changing, and he believes pollutants are part of that equation. Oh, okay. All right, Nikki. Uh, whatever you got to do to, to, to clean up the mess, it seems to me. Uh, Speaking of cleaning up the messes, the Environmental Protection Agency was kind of charged with that, right, Curtis? Yeah, when we were in, yes. when I was there working for President Obama, when you Obama, used to be a, there, that was, that was our mission. Oh yeah. my goodness! And uh, we, well, and, and so Mr. Spalding returns. He's the former EPA administrator here in our region, and uh, now is over teaching and 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 strategizing at Brown University with Dr. Stephen Porter and others. Uh, Dr. Porter is an environmentalist uh, from Brown University and comes to us for the first time this evening. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. My pleasure. It. Um, obviously, we're very concerned about the science of climate change, and so we should talk about the politics coming up in the next segment. Uh, lay it on. <laughs> I mean, how in heaven's name can we suggest that there's not something going on out there? Uh, well, no reasonable person could, and no reasonable scientist does. So uh, we know unequivocally that the climate has warmed uh, in the last century more than it warmed in uh, thousands of years before that. We know unequivocally that the, the cause of that change is our pollution. Um, and whether the president or anyone else says that their opinion is that that's not true, well, their opinion is not informed by the science. The scientists who study the climate, who understand the atmospheric science, all pretty much agree. You're from Brown, you're a liberal scientist, you're <laughs> a wacko. Well, uh, data are data, and there have been 
uh, four independent assessments of whether it's warming, or whether the world is warming. They have all come to the same conclusion, <laughs> including one by a former climate quote unquote skeptic. Uh, there is no plausible alternative for why the world is warming. Uh, the people who deny that uh, simply don't have an explanation for what could be causing the warming that's credible. And if you look at 97 plus percent of people who actually have expertise in global change and climate science, they all agree that the, now there is disagreement about how bad it will get. And that disagreement depends mostly on what we choose to do, do which brings us to the Paris Agreement, which was a first step towards lowering our emissions. It was not sufficient. It was a voluntary agreement, but it right. got all of the countries on the so, board. So we'll talk more about the policy in a second, but just on the science, it, it's sometimes hard to convince people uh, in, in our viewing area when mm -hmm. we've had probably the coolest spring sure. you know, in, in a long time. It feels like Seattle. Right? Sure. So, so there's a big difference between climate and weather. And what happens in a particular place on a particular day or a particular spring is not really relevant to climate, which is the average. If I asked you, for example, uh, whether it was going to be warmer in July than in December, you could absolutely say that it would be. That's a climate assessment. Now, if I asked you on July 15th, is it going to be warm or cold? That you couldn't do, because what you know is that on average, July is warmer than December. Similarly, we're going to have warmer years and cooler years, uh, even as the climate warms. But on average, they're getting warmer. It's not a coincidence that uh, the last time a month was cooler than average was 1988, I believe. Mm. And the last 18 years have had, I think, 16 of the warmest years on record. So the EPA's position while you were running it, or at least the regional, was that this science works. Oh, absolutely. We were, we were working on something called the President's Climate Action Plan that the President Obama announced in June of his second term. And, you know, this was really, uh, the president, because he couldn't get the help of Congress, putting together a comprehensive effort to deal with, with climate. And that included Paris, included what was called the Clean Power Plan, also included efforts to adapt. So Rhode Island has a big adaptation challenge with sea level rise and other things that are coming. So it was a comprehensive effort, and EPA was in the cornerstone of some of it. We weren't all of it. I want to be very clear. Uh, the Clean Power Plan was a, essentially a building block, but it wasn't the whole plan. Uh, so yeah, this is a 180 degree change with uh, now Administrator Pruitt, I guess, leading the charge against climate. What's the bureaucracy? Action. I mean, you're out now, but right. you're, you're, I mean, you're chatting, I'm, I'm sure. The bureaucracy must be, be, just be confounded well, I, in terms of a guy leading the place that, that, that is, is almost counterintuitive to what the EPA has stood for. Well, without chatting, because I am b bound by some uh, revolving door rules, uh -huh. uh, but it's obvious. Yeah, the, what I've heard, essentially, is there's the political folks. They haven't really appointed all the people they're supposed to. You know, there's no successor for my job. There's no, nobody running the air program or the water program or that sort of thing. They've got themselves locked in a room, and they're basically issuing dictates. And, you know, civil servants have an ethical responsibility, I guess, to do what they're asked to do. Um, but, but we know it, it, it's really, a, I think the gears are grinding very hard there right now is the bottom line. It, it's just a very challenging situation. All right. On the accord itself, uh, I, think, I think the former Secretary of State makes a good point about the, you know, about the deal. You know, he, he, you know, he wants to get out and then knock back on the door to get in. Yeah, uh, I'm, you know, I, 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 for some reason that might have been one of his real estate moves. Right. But this is a whole d different ballgame, don't you guys think? Well, I think there are a couple things. I think that uh, he's missing an enormous jobs opportunity both uh, nationally and, for, and you know, locally for us here in Rhode Island. You know, I, I looked up the other day, there's roughly double the number of people in solar energy power production than there are in power production for coal, oil, and gas combined. Um, but only one of those two is poised to really expand by a tenfold in the, next, in the coming decades if we really invest in it. If we want to get to Paris and beyond and reduce our emissions to near zero by 2050, which is what we're going to need to do to have a reasonable chance of averting catastrophic climate change, then we need massive investment in infrastructure, the kind of infrastructure that President Trump was talking about, big investments in infrastructure. Why are we building pipelines, coal-fired power plants, even natural gas-fired power plants here in Rhode Island when we could be investing in clean jobs that will both push us forward and mitigate climate change? It seems unimaginable to be that someone who's pushing a jobs 
uh, promotion package would step away from the fastest growing industry in the world and say, we don't want a part of that. We want to go back to 19th century technology. What's the question I think technology. his family is asking him, never mind everybody else, but he's <laughs> hung up on West Virginia votes that I think he made some promises for. Um, and those folks are holding on to a, a tired industry. One that we still need, by the way, but uh, one which is waning. When we come back, we'll talk about what the alternatives are going to be now and what kind of local government's input uh, may carry the day. Stay with us. You know, there are a couple arguments that people make uh, in support of Donald Trump's uh, pulling out of the uh, Paris Accord. One of them is that China and India are not doing near what we're doing in terms of environmental. Um, I got my own answer on that, but what is right. yours? Well, I, th I think the obvious point was that uh, President Obama went to Paris with the idea of bringing those people into an agreement. It was our initiative to bring them in. Mm. Uh, I think the President Trump got it backwards, essentially, and now uh, we're not leading, we're, we're doing something. Uh, it's hard to say where we actually fall, but um, India and China are now saying they're going to lead. And, and the jobs that was just referred to, well, we're going to lead on those too, is what those two countries are saying. So it wasn't the case where we were dragged into this and they extracted this out of us, these, these vol voluntary uh, commitments. This was about how we could begin the process. And as was said earlier, Paris wasn't sufficient. No, more would need to be done, um, but I have colleagues at, at EPA who talk about taking those first steps and getting everybody comfortable with the change. Um, change is hard, we know that, all the changes was just described. Tr transitioning this economy isn't an easy thing to do. Mm. Um, so the idea was to get the ball rolling. But I have to laugh at China and India leading. I mean, they, 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 they're gonna st they're, it's a politically right. smart thing for them to say, you know, we'll step in the middle of this thing as we Wow. We, the United well, States well, of America. But, but in fairness, right, the U.S. built its economy, and for decades the climate argument on the international treaty side has been about this. The U.S. built its economy and got rich on oil, coal, uh, oil and coal, right? And then we turned around and we said, oh, my God, this is a really big problem. Uh, we led the world in climate science, which is now being defunded, but uh, we said, oh, my God, this is a big problem. Uh, and now you, China and India, you don't have the right to catch up to us by using right. coal and oil, right? So this is the disagreement. The atmosphere doesn't care. If the carbon dioxide comes from, from China or comes from the U.S. or comes from India, it doesn't matter. It just matters that it's rising actually faster than any time in the four billion year history that we know about mm -hmm. of life on Earth. Right. It's, right. it's increasing more rapidly right now than it ever has. Well, China's going to have its own internal pressure. I mean, people can't walk yeah. around with, with masks on their that, faces. That's, that's right. right. It's an existential right. crisis. Right. So you've got that situation going on. But I think you guys both hit the point that I would have made. I'm glad you made it on your own, which is just to, to simplify it for everybody. Uh, India and China were so far behind the eight ball that bringing them into an agreement had to give them some space right. and time. For sure. Uh, it, it might be 2030 and change for China to actually make a huge pivot. Uh, maybe they'll accelerate actually, their pivot. Actually, they're already making that pivot. Yeah. They're already yeah. making that pivot, yeah. and their emissions may have may be close to peaking before 2030. And at, at the same time, the price of solar panels, which I used to used to be able to buy U.S.-made solar panels easily, has fallen, you know, dramatically, and now everyone's buying Chinese solar yeah, panels. I, important to note, my boss, uh, Gina McCarthy, the former administrator of EPA, she spent more time going to China to have these conversations than any country on the planet. Every week it was kind of like, where's Gina today? Well, she's off to China again. Uh, so there was a lot of um, work, bilateral work, that was going on that was important. And, you know, I, I hope, I'm hopeful it just doesn't all fall away. So the Paris to Pittsburgh remark by the president last week, you know, had the mayor of Pittsburgh stepping up saying, hey, oh, he's talking, you yeah. know, he jumps ugly with him. The mayor of Youngstown jumps ugly with him as he offers these corollaries. And even now we see governors and mayors all across the country saying, you know what, if this is not going to be our national policy, it's certainly going to be our local policy. Sure. So who picks up the ball? We only got a couple minutes here. Well, it, it's clear governors are going to step up. I, I've been part of dialogues with governors during my time, and that, uh, environmental governors work together. And that, that's been the case for a long time. I think we need to remember that states were moving forward, New England states, western states, long before even the federal government stepped up. So that they're only going to dig down and go, go harder. Cities have been going hard. But I think it's important to know the federal government has to be on the same page somehow. I, you know, the idea that this 
federal government can just step away and all these interconnection issues, mod grid modernization issues, um, some challenging issues. W we need the federal government back in the game soon. And on the Rhode Island front, yeah. you know, we have a choice right now. We're a leader in offshore wind. Those are the jobs of the future, and we could incentivize those, for example, with the Energi Energize Rhode Island bill, which is proposing a, a tax on carbon. That would incentivize the, the, the offshore wind at the expense of, admittedly, a natural gas fired power plant that's going to lock us into fossil fuel emissions for the next 50 years over the lifetime of that power plant. These are the kinds of decisions that the governor could make here in Rhode Island that could really push us in the direction of the future. And the rest of the world will just, uh, what, give me 10 seconds. Him pulling out puts the world in danger, or it's just a blip on the screen? Well, I, I think it depends how long the policy stands when you think about it. I, I think there is a, perhaps a bright side to this. It, it's going to galvanize people, uh, both internationally and, and locally. I think we kind of feel that. We see that. Um, so we'll see. All right, guys, thank you very much. When we come back, we're stuck at 45th. Don't go anywhere.